Hello everyone, this is Anita Paneru from Friesen Lab, Washington State University. Today I'm going to give a short talk on investigation of soil microbiome using electrochemical and molecular methods. Thank you for having me. As we all know, many aspects of soil health rely on microbes. Their metabolic activity that determine microbiome functions are electron transfer processes. So, electrochemical gradient produced by bacterial metabolism is used to monitor electron transfer in the soil. The picture here shows the general overview of our research, including both soil microbes and plant soil microbe system, including uh, electrochemical signals. This is the result from our preliminary experiment. It shows that the due to higher activity of micro microbes in healthy soil, current is increased in chronoamperometric scans and in SEM imaging microbes are strongly attached to the electrode for healthy soil and no microbial attachment was observed for unhealthy soil. The results from microbiome data analysis shows bacterial enrichments on electrodes. The top five ticks are mentioned below constitute more than half of the working electrode microbial community. They are Thermincola feriacetica, which is a known electrochemically active bacteria, unclassified bacillus, Citriformentus bremensis, bacillus, and disulfitobacterium. Our preliminary experiment raises some questions like uh, how do the electron transfer mechanism in the soil link electrochemical signals and microbial community structure and functions? And how do synthetic community in mesocus affect plant growth and soil health? So our goal is to understand electrochemical signals in plant soil microbiome system and relating electrochemistry to microbiome functions and soil health for a model agriculture system. To answer this question, we started soil slurry batch reactor experiments which help us to understand how indigenous microbiomes related to electrochemical signals in the soil and how do electrical potential influences the microbiome. From our soil slurry experiment, we observe an extracted biogreen from the electrodes. Sequencing and SEM imaging work are ongoing. The upcoming soil reactor experiments will vary carbon sources and include plants. In conclusion, we can say that electrochemical signals vary between more healthy and less healthy soil. Soil contain numerous electrochemically active bacteria. Lastly, I would like to thank NSF for funding this project, SoilCon for making this presentation possible, and Prison and Benel Lab for their continuous support. Thank you all. Hello everyone, my name is Evan Domsik. I'm a PhD student in the Crop and Soil Science Department at Washington State University. And today I'm excited to talk to you about enhancing quinoa nutritional quality through soil health and cropping system optimization. So first briefly just a bit about Quinopodium quinoa. Quinoa is a pseudo cereal grain grown primarily for its edible seed and it's been cultivated for approximately 7,000 years in its center of origin in South America. Uh, it is a heat, drought, and saline tolerant plant, um, and it's adapted to a wide range of latitudes and altitudes. It's naturally gluten-free and has a unique nutritional composition high in protein and amino acids. And in recent years, it's gained lots of popularity in the United States, uh, but there's still a lot unknown about this plant, um, especially in terms of how uh, organic matter-based fertilizers affect its nutritional quality. And so that led us to ask the question, how does the type and rate of fertilizer affect quinoa nutritional quality? And so to answer these questions, we set up a experiment in 2022. Um, this experiment was set up as a randomized complete block split plot design uh, with one of two varieties being the main plot and one of eight different treatments making up the split plot. Uh, we applied a uh, urea synthetic source of nitrogen at 100 pounds per acre and a yard waste compost and chicken manure pellets at 50, 75, and 100 pounds per acre. And we also included an unamended control. Uh, throughout the growing season, we collected uh, soil samples at five different time points to measure things like nitrate, ammonium, and pH, as well as uh, several important soil health indicators uh, such as permanganate oxidizable carbon and uh, mineralizable carbon. 
After harvest, we sent our seeds through our nutritional phenotyping platform uh, to measure uh, the protein content and amino acid profile of the seeds, as well as important micronutrients such as iron and zinc. And here I have a graph showing the yield um, on the uh, x-axis here you can see the different types of fertilizer treatments and on the y-axis you can see uh, the yield in pounds per acre um, and as you can see our different fertilizer treatments did impact the yields uh, but whether or not these relationships are significant or not remains to be unseen as we have uh, further statistical analyses to conduct with this data here's a similar graph showing protein uh, on the y-axis, you have protein in grams per 100 grams of sample, or you could think of this as percent protein. And again, you can see that the uh, different fertilizer treatments are having some sort of impact on our uh, quinoa seeds grown in western Washington. Um, but that leads us to the end of this quick presentation. Uh, in 2023, we we're planning on repeating this experiment. Um, uh, we also plan to conduct further statistical analyses to, to determine the significance of these uh, relationships. Um, and we are still waiting on some lab results uh, from important uh, soil health indicators that I mentioned earlier, which will be key in exploring the relationship between soil health, microbially uh, mediated nitrogen cycles, and quinoa nutrition. Uh, so hopefully next year I'll have more to share about this. Um, thank you for my for your time and if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me uh, with the information provided below. Thank you. Hi my name is Claire Phillips and I'm a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS in Pullman, Washington. There's a lot of interest in implementing soil health practices as a means to sequester soil carbon. So today I want to share with you results that we've collected from the Cook Agronomy of Farm in Pullman, where we're monitoring the carbon impacts of no-till versus conventional management. Monitoring and verifying carbon change through direct measurements of soil carbon is time-consuming and a very expensive endeavor, and it's really a challenge to emerging ecosystem service markets. For example, at the Cook Farm, we've been monitoring carbon change at over 300 georeference locations at our site. And as shown by this snapshot of carbon change through time during the first 10 years after no-till establishment, it's really spatially variable. We see some locations that were gaining carbon, other locations in the light green that hardly changed and then locations like in the red that actually lost carbon in the top three inches of the soil. We've also been monitoring carbon change with another technique called eddy covariance. And this is really useful as it provides a more spatially integrated measurement over a large area. It's also really useful in that we get a measurement on a basically an annual basis of whether the system was a net sink or a net source for carbon, rather than waiting four or five longer years to be able to detect soil carbon changes. The experiment at Cook Agronomy Farm is shown here on the right is a paired catchment study. And on the right side in Cook East, <clears throat> is our aspirational treatment, our no-tilled treatment, which was established in 1998. And on the left is the business as usual treatment. Our towers, which are located in each catchment are shown um, by the white dots and the measurements that they are capturing in CO2 moving past the tower sensors represent fluxes from he here within the colored lines. So that's the area that we're able to measure on each field. And the data that we get from the eddy covariance method look like this. So these are CO2 fluxes over the course of the year, where when the systems are really taking up a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere during the growing season, those are shown by these large spikes downward. So that's the period of most active photosynthesis. Outside of the growing season, fluxes tend to be really small, but also tend to be positive. And those are um, this CO2 that's emitted by soil microbes and through the decay of plant matter. Thumbing up fluxes over the course of an entire year, we get 
a value, a single value representing the net loss or the net gain of carbon by the system. And this figure is showing that net ecosystem carbon balance um, for several years from 2013 through 2019. Where we're missing data, we didn't have a complete flux record or we, we don't have our finalized um, yield values. So there's a few things I wanted to point out. <clears throat> First of all, most of these values are negative, meaning the system was a large carbon sink in all but a single site year. Um, and that one year where we were emitting carbon, it was uh, uh, garbanzo was the rotation, which doesn't have a lot of biomass. These data also really show how much stronger of a carbon sink wheat is compared to other rotational crops to our canola and our garbanzo bean years. 2019 was uh, also a winter wheat year and it was a low yielding year. And we see that in the carbon balance too, not nearly as much carbon was taken up. And the last point I wanna make is for these, this period of data, we don't see any systematic differences in carbon gain between the no-till and the conventional system. This no-till system has almost stopped uh, erosion. So it's been really beneficial in terms of that, but we aren't seeing the carbon differences in carbon change um, resulting from no-till adoption. Hello everyone, I'm Rana Parasati, a graduate student from University of Nebraska Lincoln and soil science and agronomic researcher from Indonesian Oil Palm Research Institute. Advantages for people, profit and planet is the core of sustainable agriculture that everyone wants to achieve. Likewise with oil palm plantation. Oil palm is a versatile commodity with up to 40% worldwide consumption that majorly produced in 16.3 million hectares land in Indonesia. Some of you may wonder how it looks like. As you can see in the right picture, the oil palm grows in seedlings to immature and mature stage with the harvested fresh fruit bunch that extracted to palm oil. Despite the spotlight on palm oil efficiency, the industry has worldwide attention associated with land use change, soil degradation, and yield gap. A win-win nature-based solution for intensifying monoculture production and increasing soil health are expected through the implementation of intercropping system. In order to get a better understanding, we observe the benefits of intercropping as well as the changes on soil properties, vegetative growth, and the economic feasibility between monoculture oil palm with Mukuna bracteata as the common legume cover crop during the immature stage with the intercropping system of common cash crops like cassava, corn, soybean, and sorghum. The research was conducted on 2021 in Tebing Tinggi, North Sumatra, Indonesia. The soil sample were collected in weeded circle and windrow area, after one year of implementation, we found that in weeded circle, pH, soil organic carbon, soil nitrogen, and C per N ratio were better in intercropping system, especially for cassava and sorghum. Moreover, if we look on the windrow area where the intercropping crops growing, there's interesting results with the highest N in soybean. Meanwhile, the highest SOC and CN ratio seen in sorghum. Next, for the soil biological activity, there was intriguing findings where both in weeded circle and windrow, there was eight times and three times increment of microbiome population, both for bacteria and fungi. Cassava has the highest bacteria population both in windrow and weeded circle area. However, for fungi population, it grows better in the windrow of corn and weeded circle of soybean. We indicate that the varied pattern of microbes may relate it with the additional input of organic matter from intercropping crops and the root system. The intercropping system will not halt the growth of the main crops, oil palm, if both crops were having sufficient nutrients which can be seen in cassava and corn pot. From the economic nexus, we recommend the order of the most visible crops are cassava, soybean, corn, and sorghum for immature oil palm intercropping system with higher profits. All in all, we conclude that the intercropping system in immature oil palm can be achieving the goals to promote sustainable oil palm and soil health as well as share benefits to people, profit, and planets. Based on environmental and economic advantages, we would recommend cassava and soybean as the top two crops for intercropping. Thank you for your time and attention. If you have any questions, feel free to reach me out.